Epistle 24 on Despising Death You write me that you are anxious about the result of a lawsuit, with which an angry opponent is threatened. And you expect me to advise you to picture to you a happier issue, and to rest in the allurements of hope. Why, indeed, is it necessary to summon trouble? which must be endured soon enough when it has once arrived, or to anticipate trouble and ruin the present through fear of the future. It is indeed foolish to be unhappy now, because you may be unhappy at some point in the future. But I shall conduct you to peace of mind by another route. If you put off all worry, assume that what you fear may happen will certainly happen in any event. Whatever the trouble may be, measure it out in your own mind, and estimate the amount of your fear. You will thus understand what you fear is either insignificant or short-lived. And you need not spend a long time in gathering illustrations which will strengthen you. Every epoch has produced them. Let your thoughts travel into any era of Roman or foreign history, and there will throng before you notable examples of high achievement or of high endeavor. If you lose this case, can anything more severe happen to you than being sent into exile or led to prison? Is there a worse fate that any man may fear than being burned or being killed? Name such penalties one by one, and mention the men who have scorned them. One does not need to hunt for them, it is simply a matter of selection. Sentence of conviction was borne by Rutilius, as if the injustice of the decision were the only thing which annoyed him. Exile was endured by Metellius with courage, by Rutilius even with gladness, for the former consented to come back only because his country called him. The latter refused to when Sulla summoned him, and nobody in those days said no to Sulla. Socrates in prison discoursed and declined to flee when certain persons gave him the opportunity. He remained there in order to free mankind from the fear of two most grievous things, death and imprisonment. Mucius put his hand into the fire. It is painful to be burned, but how much more painful to inflict such suffering upon oneself. Here was a man of no learning, not primed to face death and pain by any words of wisdom, and equipped only with the courage of a soldier, who punished himself for his fruitless daring. He stood and watched his own right hand falling away piecemeal on the enemy's brazier. Nor did he withdraw the dissolving limb with its uncovered bones until his foe removed the fire. He might have accomplished something more successful in that camp, but never anything more brave. See how much keener a brave man is to lay hold of danger than a cruel man is to inflict it. Porcena was more ready to pardon Mucius for wishing to slay him than Mucius to pardon himself for failing to slay Porcena. Oh, you say, those stories have been droned to death in all the schools. Pretty soon, when you reach the topic of on despising death, you will be telling me about Cato. But why should I not tell you about Cato? How he reads Plato's book on that last glorious night, with a sword laid at his pillow? He had provided these two requisites for his last moments. The first, that he might have the will to die. And the second, that he might have the means. So he put his affairs in order, as well as one could put in order that which was ruined and near its end and thought that he ought to see to it that no one should have the power to slay or the good fortune to save him, Cato. Drawing the sword, which he had kept unstained from all the bloodshed against the final day, he cried, Fortune, you have accomplished nothing by resisting all my endeavors. I have fought till now for my country's freedom and not for my own. I did not strive so doggedly to be free, but only to live among the free. Now, since the affairs of mankind are beyond hope, let Cato be withdrawn to safety. So saying, he inflicted a mortal wound upon his body. After the physicians had bound it up, Cato had less blood and less strength, but no less courage. Angered now, not only at Caesar, but also at himself, he rallied his unarmed hand against his wound and expelled, rather than dismissed, that noble soul which had been so defiant to all worldly power. I am not now heaping up these illustrations for the purpose of exercising my wit, but for the purpose of encouraging you to face that which is most thought to be terrible. I shall encourage you all the more easily by showing that not only resolute men have despised that moment when the soul dies, but that certain persons, who were craven in other respects, have equaled in this regard the courage of the bravest. Take, for example, Scipio, the father-in-law of Gnaeus Pompeius. He was driven back upon the African coast by a headwind and saw his ship in the power of the enemy. He therefore pierced his body with a sword, and when they asked him where the commander was, he replied, All is well with the commander. These words brought him up to the level of his ancestors and suffered not the glory which fate gave to the Scipios in Africa to lose its continuity. It was a great deed to conquer Carthage, but a greater deed to conquer death. All is well with the commander. Ought a general to die otherwise, especially one of Cato's generals? I shall not refer you to history or to collect examples of those men who throughout the ages have despised death, for they are very many. Consider these times of ours whose innervation and over-refinement call forth our complaints, they nevertheless will induce men of every rank, of every lot in life, and of every age, who have cut short their misfortunes by death. 
Believe me, Lucilius, death is so little to be feared that through its good offices nothing is to be feared. Therefore, when your enemy threatens, listen unconcernedly. Although your conscience makes you confident, yet since many things have weight which are outside your case, both hope for that which is utterly just and prepare yourself against that which is utterly unjust. Remember, however, before all else, to strip of all that disturbs and confuses, and to see which is at the bottom, and you will then comprehend that they contain nothing fearful except the actual fear. That you see happening in boys happens also to ourselves, who are only slightly bigger boys. When those whom they love, with whom they daily associate, with whom they play, appear with masks on, the boys are frightened out of their wits. We should strip the mask, not only from the men, but from things, and, re and restore to each object its own aspect. Why do you hold up before my eyes swords, fires, and throngs of executioners raging about you? Take away all that vain show behind which lurks the scariest fools. Ah, it is not but death, whom only yesterday a manservant of mine and a maidservant did despise. Why, you again unfold and spread before me, with all that great display, the whip, and the rack? Why are those engines of torture made ready, one for each several member of the body and all the other machines innumerable for tearing a man apart piecemeal? Away with all such stuff, which makes us numb with terror. And you, silence the groans, the cries, and the bitter shrieks ground out of the victim as he is torn on the rack. They are not but pain, scorned by yonder gout-ridden wretch, endured by yonder dyspeptics in the midst of his dainties, borne bravely by the girl in travail. Slight thou art, if I can bear thee. Short thou art, if I cannot bear thee. Ponder these words which you have often heard and often uttered. Moreover, prove by the result whether that which you have heard and uttered is true. For there is a very disgraceful charge often brought against our school that we deal with the words and not with the deeds of philosophy. What if you only at this moment learned that death is hanging over your head at this moment of exile, at this moment of grief? You were born to these perils. Let us think of everything that will happen as something which will happen. I know that you have already really done what I advise you to do. I now warn you not to drown your soul in these petty anxieties of yours. If you do, the soul will be dulled, and will have too little vigor left when the time comes for it to arise. Remove the mind from the case of yours to the case of men in general. Say to yourself that our petty bodies are mortal and frail. Pain can reach from the other sources than from wrong or the might of the stronger. Our pleasures themselves become torments. Banquets bring indigestion, carousals, paralysis of the muscles, and palsy. Sensual habits affect the feet, the hands, and every joint of the body. I may become a poor man. I shall then become one of many. I may be exiled. I shall then regard myself as born into the place to which I shall be sent. They may put me in chains. What then? Am I free from bonds now? Behold this clogging burden of a body to which nature has fettered me. I shall die, you say. You mean to say, I shall cease to run the risk of sickness, I shall cease to run the risk of imprisonment, I shall seek to run the risk of death. I am not so foolish as to go through, at this juncture, the arguments which Epicurus harps upon, and say that the terrors of the world below are idle, that Ixion does not whirl round on his wheel, that Sisyphus does not shoulder his stone uphill, that a man's entrails cannot be restored and devoured every day, like that Prometheus. No one is so childish as to fear Cerberus, or the shadows, or the spectral garb of those who are held together by naught but their unfleshed bones. Death either annihilates us, or strips us bare. If we are then released, there remains the better part. After the burden has been withdrawn, if we are annihilated, nothing remains. Good and bad alike are removed. Allow me at this point to quote a verse of yours, first suggesting that when you wrote it, you meant for yourself no less than others. It is ignoble to say one thing and mean another, and how much more ignoble to write one thing and mean another. I remember one day that you were handling the well-known commonplace, that we do not suddenly fall on death, but advance toward it by slight degrees. We die every day. For every day a little of our life is taken from us. Even when we are growing, our life is on the wane. We lose our childhood, then our boyhood, and then our youth. Counting even yesterday, all past time is lost time. The very day which we are now spending is shared between ourselves and death. It is not the last drop that empties the water clock, but all that which previously has flowed out. Similarly, the final hour when we cease to exist does not itself bring death. It merely of itself completes the death process. We reach death at that moment, but we have been a long time on the way. In describing the situation, you said in your customary style, for you are always impressive, but never more pungent than when you are putting the truth in appropriate words. You said... Not single is the death which comes. The death which takes us off is but the last of all. I prefer that you should read your own words rather than my letter, for then it will be clear to you that this death, 
of which we are afraid, is the last, but not the only death. I see what you are looking for. You are asking what I have packed into my letter, what inspiring saying from some mastermind, what useful precept, so I shall send you something dealing with this very subject which has been under discussion. Epicurus upbraids those who crave as much as those who shrink from death. Quote, it is absurd, he says, to run towards death because you are tired of life, when it is your manner of life that has made you run towards death. End quote. In other passage, he says, quote, what is so absurd as to seek death when it is through fear of death that you are being robbed your life of peace, end quote. And you may add a third statement on the same stamp, quote, Men are so thoughtless, nay, so mad, that some, through fear of death, force themselves to die, end quote. Whichever these ideas you ponder, you will strengthen your mind for the endurance alike of death and of life. And we need not be warned and strengthened in both directions not to love or to hate life ever much. Even when reason advises us to make an end of it, the impulse is not to be adopted without reflection or at headlong speed. The grave and wise man should not beat a hasty retreat from life. He should make a becoming exit. And above all, he should avoid the weakness that has taken possession of so many, the lust for death. For just as there is an unreflecting tendency of the mind towards other things, so, my dear Lucilius, there is an unreflecting tendency towards death. This often seizes upon the noblest and most spirited men, as well as on the craven and the abject. The former despise life, the latter find it irksome. Others are also moved by a satiety of doing and seeing the same things, and not so much by a hatred of life as because they are cloyed with it. We slip into this condition while philosophy itself pushes us on. And we say, how long must I endure these same things? How long shall I continue to wake and sleep, be hungry and be cloyed, shiver and perspire? There is an end to nothing. All these things are connected in a sort of circle. They flee and they are pursued. Night is close at the heel of day, day at the heels of night. Summer ends in autumn, winter rushes after autumn, winter softens into spring. All nature in this way passes only to return. I do nothing new. I do nothing new. I see nothing new. Sooner or later one sickens of this also. There are many who think that living is not painful, but superfluous. Farewell.